And we're back. Hello, everyone. Hey, everybody. And, uh, yeah, so uh, we're going to switch right over to Anime Conspiracies with this person right here. Um, and, uh, yeah, so let us just go ahead and get into it. I think we do that, do that, and, uh, yep, uh, microphone is on, so good to go. go All right, yeah, sure. Chat's right there. Chat's right there. Okay, cool. Yep. Yep. All right. Uh, hey, everybody. My name is uh, Justin Cole. I'm a member of the Group Otaku Brain Trust with Brent. Uh, we were going to uh, start doing panels in like 2020 as a group together, and then you know some stuff happened. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we actually had that discussion at Anime USA 2019, mm. and unfortunately, we haven't really actually. We've been to we went to Katsukon, and mm. we did. Uh, our group did a few panels there. Our, we have a few panelists from the East Coast who are all in the Northern Virginia region, and we we just decided that we would possibly be able to use the group as a way of bouncing ideas off of each other, and as maybe as well as pushing for uh, more slots, more content, whatever. Uh, yeah, yeah, stuff be is definitely the hundred hundred ton elephant in the room. <laughs> Um, so it's, uh, it's a, you know, it's also good that Brent is running these online cons too, so that we can, for any of the members who are here, or even, uh, one of our members is down in Texas right now, uh, that we can do these types of panels, uh, because it's, it's nicer to have shorter intervals of time for these in order for us to practice them, present them, so on and so forth. Uh, and this is one of the panels that I wanted, want to do at a convention eventually. I've submitted it to a few conventions, but I'm not entirely surprised that no conventions <laughs> accepted it yet. Conspiracy is uh, somewhat of a touchy word uh, within uh, you know, the general public because people aren't sure which direction you're generally trying to go with it. I, uh, oops, I right clicked on accident. Yeah, okay. I'll just make this Oop, full yeah, screen yeah, yeah. here, and uh, I decided I, I wanted to do anime conspiracy uh, because I listen to a lot of uh, podcasts that cover that kind of like uh, to use to use the generic term that woo woo stuff, the crazy stuff. The uh, <clears throat> I, I I I venture into the realm of conspiracy theories that are just wild and wacky as opposed to you know uh, the the hyper specific stuff of the conspiracy theorists today which is usually pretty hateful and usually pretty toxic i i like the stuff of uh, the the 1900s and before when people were talking about um alien spaceships uh you know shadow governments that weren't spe specifically targeted at any certain race or people um so I I discovered in watching a few shows that some shows like to use these conspiracy theories as a basis for their uh, plots. And what I mean by that is I'm not talking about like the generic student council uh, Illuminati <laughs> shadow government stuff, which, you know, is present in quite a few different shows. Uh, I'm talking about very like very specific examples that are referenced by name in anime uh, and in one or two cases in this some video games uh, but I actually when I was looking into this uh, finding hyper specific examples of things that were explicitly referenced is not the easiest thing to do there are some obvious examples which I'll get into here but the uh, the very specific stuff or uh, if uh, if anybody has any suggestions for any anime that use actual conspiracy theories from real life in their plots, please let me know either after this or I I, I don't know if I have my contact information, but uh, you know Brent's here and I'm sure he can get in contact with me pretty easy. <laughs> um, so let's uh, let the the overview of this is I'm going to go over a few different. Uh, one or two different conspiracy theories and then mention the anime that they were a part of 
if you want to play along at home, quote unquote, uh, I, I'm going to show the conspiracy theories first and you can try and guess what uh, the show is going to be. In some cases, it'll be much more obvious than in others. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll go into my main inspirations for this as I cover them because I don't want to spoil what I'm looking or what I'm talking about. But I did want to talk about these as well because uh, with the podcasts like the last podcast on the left and uh, stuff like uh, Astonishing Legends, if anybody's heard or seen of that, they cover a lot of these same kinds of cryptids, of aliens, of... Uh, mystical mystical teachings and uh, one program I know of that is very popular is uh, Coast to Coast AM which a lot of uh, not a lot of this content in this panel comes from but a lot of content for a lot of other podcast creators and a lot of uh, conspiracy theories and all that stuff comes from there if anybody wants to just listen to hours upon hours upon hours of people calling in and talking about wacky crazy kooky stuff coast to coast am i believe has a massive archive they've been I, I i'm not sure how long they've been going but i know they've been going since at least the 1990s probably before then uh with a few different hosts over the years and uh it's definitely the most famous uh u.s example of that kind of content being put into the mainstream uh also to clarify with the uh, conspiracy theories and even in the cases of the shows and games sometimes there is a lot of content to these conspiracy theories there is a ton of information uh, whether it be legitimate or just insane ramblings but I am not going to be able to cover any of these in depth in the course of one hour and I'm going to be covering multiple of them so they will be touching on uh, some some different ideas uh kind of kind of a inch deep and mile wide scenario i'll be touching on a lot of different ideas but not going too in depth on them although i will be trying to talk about some more than others because uh like i said before it's not so easy to find examples of these things within uh anime but i do uh want to start off with uh, my, one of my one uh, cute example, which is uh, this picture from Euro Camp of uh, Nadeshko, the main character, walking in the same form as Bigfoot when she was captured on Google Maps. This is this is not going to be something I talk about for very long. I just I like this reference. Obviously, obviously the Patterson Gimli film uh, was, uh, is the, probably the most famous cryptozoology and potentially conspiracy theory related video in existence. Um, even still talked about to this day, it is, it is nice to see those, those little references here and there, especially in a sh camping show. Uh, but, uh, I will, uh, let's, uh, let's just get into some of the main material of the content. And the first thing I want to talk about uh, is Roswell, obviously. Uh, if Bigfoot is the most famous cryptozoology, Roswell is the most famous uh, alien encounters. And uh, Roswell was a, a alien encounter in 1947 in New Mexico where a rancher and... Uh, give me one second, I'm trying to find my uh, presenter notes. Oh, I meant uh, uh, all time. Where did that go? Um, uh, it might have gone away when I yeah, full screen yeah. this. Okay. Oh, there we go. It doesn't okay. work with. Okay, whatever. Huh. Um. And there's no. Huh. That's Maybe not. that's a browser thing. Huh. Could be. Okay. Well, I can I can yeah. still do that. Oh well, it's mm. not not a big deal. Uh, there was a rancher by the name of. Uh, w. w. Mac Brazel, who discovered some uh, debris in a field in uh, decided to hide it under a bush. Now, where we start getting into some issues here is that he claims that this had been hidden under a brush, but he never documented that until the uh, Fort 
Fort Worth uh, Army Airfield Marshal or Major named Jesse Marcel came up and handled the debris and moved it to a second location. And at this point, uh, the official narrative of where it is and uh, who's handling it kind of goes out the window in favor of uh, hearsay and conspiracy theory. But it's believed, obviously, that the material found was this kind of super advanced metal that was uh, used to create some type of spacecraft. And depending on who is uh, discussing the conspiracy theory, there are there were small gray men, uh, potentially alive small gray men found in the aircraft, who uh, potentially were aliens. Although there are also many theories as to if they had been potent maybe Russians who had been experimented on, and the other thing feeding the fuel into this conspiracy theory is that. The army originally said that they had found a flying disc, but they very, very quickly retracted it and said that it was a weather balloon. And this is where the most popular interpretation of uh, ufologists, the, just the fact that all UFOs are weather balloons, quote unquote, or swamp gas, this is where the weather balloon theory came from, as it also is one of the original most famous and uh, one of the original UFO incidents within the U.S. Uh, there are UFO incidents that come before this, and most notably Christopher Columbus did claim to see flying lights in the sky on the journey over. But uh, as far as modern ufology goes and what we have documented, this has the most information. There's a ton of uh, reading you can do on Roswell, a ton of uh, videos, uh, debunkings or providing more evidence of or so on and so forth it is it's been talked to death about because it is the most famous ufo story in uh the u.s at the very least if not the world at this point it's been referenced not only in the show i'm going to bring up but it's been referenced in uh countless other media even in, in something like futurama had its own episode on roswell and Roswell itself has fully embraced the ufology. They have uh, giant alien, you know, blow-up dolls outside of their uh, town. They have their sign there, you can see, has a UFO over top of it. And I think it really worked out for them because they were just some town out in the middle of the desert. Although, if I remember correctly, this incident didn't actually even happen in Roswell. It happened outside of Roswell, but it got associated with Roswell because of either the where the rancher lived or uh, because it was the closest town. Uh, but anyway, that's not important. But the uh, the story actually of this was not too focused on for about 30 years until the 70s. Stanton Freeman interviewed the major of Fort Worth, Marcel. And Marcel told him this story, told him about the materials. Obviously, this is... 30 years removed so who knows how accurate the retelling was but uh, Stanton Freeman was one of the most famous uh, UFO researchers of the time and the the UFO community tries to re retain its legitimacy by doing things like questioning and uh, discussing and uh, being skeptical of any claims made like this and Stanton Freeman was trying to do that here but it also just reignited the whole mystery, and it's been really in the public conscious since since about the 1970s, even though it happened in 1947. <clears throat> As for why the aliens were down there, some people believe it had to do with nuclear strikes. The aliens saw them, and because Roswell was near a nuclear testing facility or an army base, they uh, came down to see what was going on. Uh, there is... The famous conspiracy theorist Bill Cooper as well, who ties this in to some other theories we'll talk about later, that um, the aliens had, there were multiple alien crashes, multiple alien bodies recovered, multiple human bodies found mutilated, and they were all around a similar area in the deserts and so on. And speaking of aliens, the Majestic 12 was an organization that was either put together depending on who you ask, by Harry Truman or Dwight Eisenhower in 1947 to 1952 time frame in order to uh, figure out how to combat and discuss the alien 
encounters. Now, the the more innocent explanations of the Majestic Twelve are that they were formed in a, in order to handle uh, how to discuss aliens, to research aliens, potentially to talk to aliens and meet with aliens, and more malicious interpretations such as Bill Cooper uh, believe that the Majestic Twelve, or known known as well as the Majority Twelve, were there to become a shadow puppet government in order to influence uh, worldly events and uh, control the U.S. and the events that Bill Cooper claimed that the Majestic 12 was responsible for was that they were able to orchestrate Kennedy's assassination because he threatened them with revealing alien technology. Uh, They were able to gets Dwight Eisenhower to meet with an alien ambassador in which Dwight Eisenhower made a deal with the alien ambassador that the aliens would be able to abduct some humans but in exchange the U.S. would get alien technology in order to uh, advance our desire to do something like go to the moon. Um, There is actually, if you want to read more about the inception of this, the FBI website has the fake Eisenhower document, although they were very petty about the document. They wrote bogus in big, bold letters across the, uh, some of the pages, instead of just, you know, and they, uh, I'm not sure if they redacted it or if the document originally had redacted information, but that also fueled some conspiracy, because if it was a fake document, why were they redacting any information? Um, and uh, this actually comes up in some other properties as well Deus Ex has its own interpretation of the Majestic 12 although I believe it's a a little different than how it is in real life here and um, Bill Cooper also believes that Majestic 12 orchestrated the construction of several alien bases about 75-ish alien bases underground in the US in order to (coughs) Uh, communicate with aliens and uh, figure out alien technology and they even uh, whenever bush who was a member and the leader of the majestic 12 had his own uh he he named the alien that they found at roswell which happened to still be alive the extraterrestrial biological entity also known as ebe and that alien apparently lived until 1952 before dying of uh, health complications and if you want to know more about bill cooper or want to get more of a glimpse into his head he does have a book that was published himself in the 90s or so uh called behold a pale horse in which he lays out all of his ideas and he he is truly like one of the last great ones of conspiracy theories before you get people like alex jones who are just mostly doing it out of maliciousness. Bill Cooper was fully convinced that uh, his his interpretations were correct, but he wasn't directing his hatred at any one group of people, and he didn't have a massive following that he could direct to harass anybody about it. He also died in a shootout with the cops. Uh, oh. Yeah, so <laughs> he, he was uh, a little... He, he, I think it had something to do with him originally declaring that he like wasn't going to pay taxes and so on and so forth and always ends well yeah and eventually it it got a little bit too crazy Mm -hmm. they tried to come get him he came out shooting and he lost his life in the shootout but there is still a ton of material out there for you to absorb of his uh and the one thing i forgot to mention is that uh the nixon impeachment was also apparently orchestrated by the majestic 12 Uh. Uh, Nixon, uh, I think, I don't know why they, I mean, obviously the impeachment was for Watergate. I think, I can't remember if they did it as a response to, or they did it before. They didn't want, uh, Nixon was threatening to not quit. So the Majestic 12 did, led a military coup against the government in secret and commanded all the generals to not obey any orders from the White House, which then forced the impeachment of Nixon, uh, which is obviously how it went in history, and it wasn't just that Nixon realized that, you know, the writing was on the wall. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. 
Um, <laughs> we also have uh, Carl Jung in the Collective Unconscious, which is the this is like loosely defined as a conspiracy theory. This is much more uh, uh, what's it called? It is much more loosely defined than any of these other things. The Collective Unconscious has been dismissed by modern day um, psych uh, scientists and psychoanalysts to some degree, but uh, I, no one's ever been able to fully disprove it because Jung's interpretation of the collective unconscious was very much based in uh, a, a metaphysical sense and something that couldn't necessarily be proven. The idea of the collective unconscious is almost written right there on the tin, that humanity has a deeper level of consciousness beyond what we know of, that where we are connected to everybody else, all other humans on the planet, which he believed explained uh, some occurrences of uh, things such as twins being able to feel each other's uh, emotional states uh, or you getting a, a strange feeling when a loved one of yours is uh, dying. Uh, and there, there is, Jung actually, he wrote a ton of material on the collective unconscious and he incorporated it into some of his other theories such as the ego and the shadow which is an idea that uh, where every, almost essentially uh, yin and yang opposites which is a, a theory that other games have played around with such as Persona 4 with the shadow self uh, very much also influenced by Jung and he also he dipped his toes into the occult he believed that uh, occultism could help prove the existence of the collective unconscious and along with that and what we'll be getting into when we talk about the show is uh, this the the Schumann resonance Schumann resonances which is a extremely low frequency electromagnetic field that covers the earth and is used to study lightning strikes and uh, weird light events that were uh, within the context of the show that I'm going to be talking about are used as well to help connect everybody on an uh, electromagnetic uh, wavelength as well as uh, whatever wavelength the collective unconscious is working on. And the last person I want to talk about before talking about the show is John C. Lilly, who is also a very fascinating figure. And the John C. Lilly is a psychoanalyst who specialized in uh, a multitude of different fields. He was into big into drug study, big into LSD. He, uh, for anybody who's watched or who's heard about Lilly, they'll know about the Dolphin House, which is the most inf infamous slash famous example of Lilly's work. Um, the teacher uh, known as Margaret. Uh, how Lovat was trying to teach dolphins how to communicate at, with humans, trying to teach dolphins to speak like humans. Uh, those uh, those experiments were not successful, but it was very interesting because he he basically converted a house into a dolphin human uh, sanctuary habitat. Uh, there would be ways for the dolphins to swim up within the, the hallways of the house and so on and so forth. And uh, this was him experimenting partially to get dolphins to communicate with humans and also to experiment on how dolphins communicated with each other over such large distances, uh, which he was very interested in. He also was one of the purveyors of developing an isolation tank, which is a sen sensory deprivation tank where uh, you don't. You're, the goal is to not hear, feel, see, uh, use any of your senses except your mind, and in order to uh, force an introspection into yourself and to, especially when you're on LSD, experience a lot of a lot of different mental states uh, without the interference of any of your other senses. I already know my mind. <laughs> nobody, nobody needs to know that. Uh, he also believed in the Earth Conscious Control Office called ECHO, which yeah. apparently was not named, or was not the 
influence for Echo the Dolphin. Okay. Apparently <laughs> not, but I, I'd be surprised if it wasn't to some degree. Yeah. They were a hierarchy of cosmic beings that controlled all of existence that Lily believed that we could reconnect to under the right circumstances. Uh, he also came up with a lot of these theories on drugs. Uh, but that is not to dismiss the, the validity of uh, mind-altering substance, substances with the either the therapeutical sense of them or the fact that they may be able to open your mind to uh, ideas and interpretations of reality that may or may not be valid. And that is, that is a completely different conversation. But... Uh, Lily, Lily was a very, very interesting figure. He, this is, there's, like I said, there is a ton more stuff for Lily for all of these people that I can't get into in such a short amount of time. But the one of the main inspirations for this panel and what I've been talking about so far are all because of Serial Experiments Lane. That was Eurocamp. Yeah. yeah. What? That was Eurocamp. Yeah. Well, yeah. not this time. <laughs> so Serial Experiments Lane is a show that aired in 1998 by director Ryotaro Nakamura written by uh, Yoshitoshi Abe and uh, Shaka J. J Konaka also responsible for things like Digimon Tamers and it has a, it throws a lot of ideas at the screen almost literally to see what sticks and it's my favorite show of all time uh, for a multitude of reasons, one of which just being that it, it does so much with such a short runtime, it presents so many ideas. Uh, I won't say it's a very entertaining show to watch all the time, uh, and I understand for people who don't necessarily want to watch all of it, but it is, it has a lot of really cool ideas. It presents them in a very unique way. The the material is very ambitious somewhat told through the lens of Lane Iwakura, who is a 14-year-old girl who is ambiguously, like, exists within a reality. She is a basically a construct of whether it be the collective unconscious of the planet or whether she be a complete android that was created uh, by the series antagonist Masami Eri. She was... Uh, she, the series follows her as she learns what the Wired is, learns how to control her influence over the uh, over the Wired itself, and the show uses things like Roswell, the collective unconscious, Schumann residences, and the research of John C. Lilly and other scientists in order to construct a narrative of how Lane exists. How the collect, how the the wired was achieved, what the goal is of Masami Eri is, he wants to connect all of humanity into one one entity on the wired so that he can rule over all of them as its god, uh, which is a surprisingly not not uncommon uh, storyline in anime. I mean, even Gellion <laughs> had that same type of storyline, although apparently Lane was not directly influenced by even Gellion. Uh, it is it is a story that uh, follows. It has a central plot line running through it, but the the main meat of it is all of these ideas that it brings up, not just about conspiracy, but also about society, about religion, uh, about technology. It's a series that still rings true, twenty three, twenty four years later now, even more so than it did uh, when it aired originally. It was very very well thought out. I highly recommend anybody watch it or rewatch it, as some of the commenters have said here. If, it, definitely worth a rewatch, especially if you were trying to look at it critically through the lens of just it, it, the information it's presenting to you, and not trying to watch it as a show that has that makes really any narrative sense at all. Uh, for those who have already seen the show and want to know more, there's a video game. Uh, for Lane as well, that is now available entirely online, translated in English. It is uh, operating system based. You don't even have to download anything for it. If you just search Lane PS1 game online, it should come up. I don't think anybody's going to come and try and uh, copyright strike it. I don't think anybody cares that much about a PS1 game that didn't sell well. So that game is also pretty pretty dense and pretty hard to get through. And also trigger warning it does cover a lot of very dark material 
especially therapy related, suicide related. So if you are not comfortable with that, I would not recommend playing the game. But the show does not cover those same types of uh, subjects. Uh, and it, it tells a very different story, still focusing on like the game and the story and the show both focus on lane, but they focus on different types of stories. And I only thought I was going to talk about Lane for 20 minutes. It looks like I've talked about that stuff for 30 minutes. Surprise. I'm shocked. Yeah. So we'll move on to uh, some more obscure stuff for Hollow... This is the Hollow Earth theory. And around 1692-ish, question mark, uh, Edmund Haley actually proposed that the Earth was hollow on the inside. And Edmund Haley, for those who uh, might be aware, is the one who discovered Halley's Comet as well, also just happened to think that the Earth was hollow. There are multiple different theories about what the hollow Earth is, uh, what is inside of it, what the purpose is. Uh, obviously, for those people who have seen the new Godzilla film as well, they actually use hollow Earth theory as the origination point for the kaiju like Godzilla and King Kong which I think is pretty cool as a way of uh, just embracing the full-on uh, craziness of Godzilla as a creature. And there are multiple, like, multiple different cultures have actually arrived at the Hollow Moon, or Hollow Earth, sorry, interpretation without any communication between uh, cultures to that degree. I mean, it's not, it's, it's, interesting sometimes how cultures can arrive at these similar ideas with their own spins on it even though they don't they were there was before before phones before the internet before telegrams all that stuff it was very hard to get these ideas across lines and a a lot of different cultures just happen to believe that underneath the crust of the earth there was an entire world or a paradise or something along those lines and in some cases it even went crazier believing that the Atlanteans had retreated under uh, under the earth into the middle of the earth and uh, the inside is described as having a sun potentially the core of the earth that sustains the life within it there was an explorer named John Cleve Symes who was it made was adamant that he was going to find the entrance to the hollow earth which he believed was somewhere in Antarctica which he traveled to originally he was never able to find an entrance to the hollow earth uh, surprisingly enough it is obviously it's the inspiration for many many properties such as journey to the center of the earth and that also kind of kick started some more people's interest in it and kick kicked off some more theories now one of the interpretations of oh, i didn't remove that of the middle of the earth is agartha and agartha is a product of uh, western esotericism and was definitely popularized by helena blavatsky who we'll talk about in a little while here helena blavatsky is one of the most influential occultists uh occultists of the not only the ninth the twentieth century but partially of the nineteenth century as well. So there is an idea that the the old ones and it, it, old intelligent advanced species such as potentially Atlanteans, Lemurians, what have you, are living within the center of the earth in Agartha, that it's a legendary kingdom that will potentially rise again one day and I, there's a there's a lot of information that comes out of these these things like Agartha and where they came from and how they came from. I what I missed out when I did some of this research for this panel is like why a lot of these things are happening. It it I believe when people come up with this stuff, they have a reason as to why these things are occurring and why they believe this is happening. I believe Blavatsky's theories involved a lot of. Uh, the the root species and the root races and where where humanity came from and where humanity was destined for in the future but agartha is also not the only interpretation of hollow earth we'll get into that later but i i should talk about the the movie that's i 
that Agartha is used in majorly, which is Children Who Chase Lost Voices. Uh, it is a film by Makoto Shinkai, who's my favorite director. Now, Children Who Chase Lost Voices is not Shinkai's strongest work, to preface that. It is very pretty to look at. He gets to flex a lot of muscles, such as uh, his fantasy muscles, that he doesn't usually get to show off in his other works, although he sprinkles in sci-fi slash science fantasy in his other works like Your Name and Weathering With You. But he got to go absolutely wild in Weathering or in Children Who Chase Lost Voices. It is also known as Journey to Agartha in Japan. The the center of the the, the it involves a young plucky girl who runs across a mysterious boy who she believes dies. Her teacher ends up to be being a somewhat conspiracy theorist who believes he knows how to get to the center of the earth to re and he wants to revive his dead wife he believes Agartha is the land of the dead that they will be able to uh, revive the boy who died as well as his wife and this is almost straight up dead on like uh, it was him taking the premise of hollow earth and just turning it into a, a plot now interestingly <clears throat> before Shinkai uh, went, made this movie. He had taken a vacation after five centimeters per second, I believe, was his previous work. And he, his team told him to take a trip around the world or wherever he wanted because he was going to be busy after he started making more and more movies. And especially nowadays because he's pretty much world famous now. And he traveled to London, he did a lot of research on a lot of different cultures, and within Children Who Chase Lost Voices, he crammed a lot of that into the story. He, he even uh, uses Quetzalcoatl, which is not present from what I've seen in any interpretations of Agartha itself, but he took a lot of different cultures, uh, mysticism, and spiritualism and put it into the center of the earth here he used Quetzalcoatl as keepers of the dead and he I wish I had included more pictures here because the designs he used are pretty crazy for those as well but he really got to uh, explore a lot of these ideas in a way that he felt was interesting the movie also could be considered his for his attempt at a quote-unquote Ghibli film because up until this point he had been compared to Hayao Miyazaki quite a lot and you'll notice that after he made this movie he very quickly retreated back into doing his wheelhouse with Garden of Words and yeah, hopefully his next film is going to be another kind of fantasy based uh, adventure that is much different from this but it's he, he's only about 49 years old so I would like to see him approach fantasy again because obviously with his visual style and his studio visual or talent for backgrounds for drawing i think he could create some amazing stuff and uh maiden abyss yeah somebody brought up maiden abyss in the comments it, it probably could be considered pretty similar here i haven't actually yeah. seen maiden abyss okay yeah i mean it, it, in um like it, that's an interesting point because like there's this giant pit they're going down into and so it is technically a, I mean, it's not like there is a giant hollow earth, but it is definitely, you know, in that same realm of fantastic kind of concepts. Hmm. Yeah, I might have to see if there was any influence there that was used for that. Um, but like I said, Agartha is not the only interpretation of the hollow earth. There is also Shambhala. And Shambhala, it comes from uh, <laughs> Buddhism, where there is a prophecy that's, the world will decline into war and greed. There will be a, a faction of humans who believe in materialism above all else, and they will try to lead a incursion into Shambhala. Uh, somehow, it was it was prophesized that the end of the uh, that the conflict would come in the year twenty four twenty four or twenty four twenty five, which is three three uh, three thousand three hundred and four years after Buddha passed, and. The uh, Radha Chakran, uh, apologies for any any pronunciations I get wrong, who was who the final king of Shambhala would rise to defeat the 
evil forces and let Buddhism endure for another 1800 years. And Shambhala actually makes its way into a few different properties. Doctor Strange has, straight up has a tale about him visiting Shambhala as well. And that'd be a very interesting Marvel movie adaptation. <laughs> But they are they are going pretty wacky with the next uh, strange movie anyway. So, yeah. Uh, so, Shambhala also is known as Shangri La, which is a probably more well known name than Shambhala is. It is it is a uh, paradise. It is meant to be the kingdom of enlightenment for those who have reached uh, enlightenment, such as the original Buddha has. It is also again. She's going to come up a lot. Uh, Madame Blavatsky did mention it here and there. She never went into much detail about why she was talking about it, but uh, they, she, she believed that finding Shambhala would lead, would be the, would benefit humanity, and she uh, also did believe in Hollow Hollow Earth as well. To the, from what I know, I believe she might have also thought the Vril were down there as well, the Vril Ya, which is another thing we'll be talking about a little later on. Uh, actually, we might be, you know, we'll talk, be talking about it now. I forgot that we'll be talking about the Thule Society as well, which is a German organization that was uh, established in about the late 1800s, early 1900s. It was overtaken by... Uh, Walter Nauhaus, who was one of the early members of the Nazi party, the Thule Society up until its disbandment in 1935 had quite a few notable Nazi party members. Walter Nauhaus was very heavily involved in occultic thought and it is believed that the Thule Society was also involved in that kind of thought as well. There are the, the People who believe that there is nothing to the Thule Society will say that it is just, was just a right-wing think tank, essentially, of the time in Nazi Germany and fell apart in, in, the, in the rise of the Nazi Party itself. But there were several notable members from the Nazi Party involved in the society. And there, were also, there was also a team that did lead exhibitions in the different parts of the world for the Nazis. One of them was to Tibet which to Western thinkers of the time, Tibet was this very mystical, very mysterious place where based on the stereotype of Eastern mysticism, they thought that uh, the, the East was hiding some secrets from them that were locked behind Tibet. Uh, Madame Blavatsky also went to Tibet several times to try and uncover the mysteries of Tibet. Mostly just Westerners poking their nose into... Uh, <laughs> Chinese mysticism and trying to, yeah <laughs> trying to trying to understand it quote unquote because that that was it was weird and mystical so they also they they probably just went to Tibet to tr see how well it would be established and to try and trick the west into thinking that they the Nazis had conquered further mm. further west than they or further into the east than they actually had um so somebody did somebody did make a guess here but I'll, I'll talk about the Vril Society as well. The Vril Society was the, the... Some people believe it was a precursor to the Thule Society. Some people believe it was a the the uh, female Nazi party, or female Nazi group for the Thule Society, whereas the Thule Society would be the male group. Uh, the Vril comes from a book called The Power of the Coming Race, which was about angelic super beings called the Vril Ya that control Vril, which is a mystical, powerful energy that can be used with their minds in order to create or destroy. And of course, that would be in the Nazis' interests to find. So some of the exhibitions were to potentially find the Vril, uh, which also ties into Atlantis as well. The Vril were apparently descendants of the Atlanteans, and as they resided in the middle of the earth, it could be a, they could be connected easier that way. Um, and there is also, for those who really want to get wild with it, 
there is a belief that the Nazis did find real technology then that they used to create spaceships where they went to Antarctica to establish bases as well as the moon to establish bases, which is seen in <laughs> movies like Iron Sky, The Coming Race. That, that is not a movie, it's a documentary. Yeah, the <laughs> documentary, <laughs> sorry, the coming, the coming Race. Which, again, Iron Sky, The Coming Race, The Coming Race is a reference to the original book about the Vril. And, of course, for uh, those who guessed it in the comments, yes, I'm talking about Full Metal Alchemist, The Conqueror of Shambhala, a very, very odd movie for this for the series. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. It broke a lot of the established rules of the Full Metal Alchemist universe. It decided to use uh, Dietlind Eckhart, who is a reference to a member of the Thule Society, not a member of herself, but she was based off a male member of the Thule Society. She was trying to use the homunculus in order to open Shambhala uh, in order to achieve ultimate power and replace Hitler as the leader of the Nazi party yep. and uh, I don't know well I, the, 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 the reveal was that Shambhala was actually the world of the alchemists and yes that getting, getting alchemy for her did grant her immense power um, yeah this the, the movie was came out actually in 2005 at this point so a long time ago. I mean, there was a... Yeah, there was a Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood movie as well, but that was much more grounded in the established rules of FMA. For some reason, they just went absolutely wild with Conqueror Shambhala. They, uh, it was always you know, known that the original setting of FMA was took in a lot of inspiration from Germany, but they just went full on and said, like, yeah, they're living in the same time as the Nazis in... Also, Hitler's there, but he doesn't have a speaking role. They didn't yeah. give him a speaking role in the movie. Wow. Oh, yeah. It sounds like somebody wanted to tell that story, and they also happened to have FMA characters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, I mean, it. I don't know if this movie is, like, it's not necessarily, like, entertaining or, I mean, it is entertaining. It's not necessarily great. It is interesting to see, like, a... Nazi occultism movie put into Full Metal Alchemist yeah. because it's just it just feels wild to me that they went went that way. I, I just love the fact that in that movie they make um, what, 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 who is it? Not greed. Um, Fuhrer. Uh, um, yeah, pride. Bradley. Yeah, pride. Okay. Yeah. They make pride basically <laughs> Fritz Fritz Lang. Yeah. Oh, wow. the movie director. And yeah. Just like, yeah. What, what? <laughs> So uh, I think I've got a, I'm actually doing okay. Well, actually, I might be a little bit behind on time. But mm. uh, Hollow Moon is another hollow conspiracy theory, which involves the idea that like maybe the Earth's hollow or maybe the Moon's hollow. And a lot of a lot of thinkers who pro propositioned this originally didn't have any ulterior motives. They just said the Moon can't be solid. It's got to be hollow. And everybody was like, "What does that mean?" They said, "I don't." I don't know, the moon's hollow. There are some that believe that the moon came into existence after aliens built it uh, X number of years ago, and X being whatever they think, whenever they think the moon came into being. Uh, yeah. And uh, the, the idea that it's an alien spaceship, you ask them why aliens would build the spaceship, there's no also no answer for why the aliens would want to build a spaceship. Obviously, it could be... Uh, seeding the earth it could be uh, monitoring the human race but there is no centralized reason as to why aliens would build a spaceship and um there's like a lot of like weird evidence like when the uh, apollo mission struck the moon with a large object to impact it to see what would happen they claimed that there was a ringing like sound but that was only due to the fact that uh, moon rocks are less dense than material on the Earth, so it would produce a different effect. It doesn't mean the entire moon is hollow. And from that picture, some of you might already guess that, that this is from Gurren Lagann, oh, yeah. in which uh, it wasn't actually an alien spaceship. Lord Genome, who was a human, turned the moon into... or created a fake moon. He hid the real moon away in another dimension because Gurren Lagann's normal. <laughs> and Imaishi's always normal. And, yeah. And he turned it into a spaceship to use in case the anti-spirals attacked, but they, they took control over it, 
and they used it to try and wipe out humanity. But it, it is pretty close to an example of an alien spaceship that is that the, the moon would be hollow and being used as an alien spaceship. Uh, which, there's not too much more to say there with Gurren Lagann. I mean, there's... You, for those who have seen Gurren Lagann, you know what it is. It's crazy, and I... I don't even know if this decision was made consciously with the idea of Hollow Moon in mind, but it was interesting that it came up in this way. Uh, there is also Fate Extra, in which the moon is a uh, something called the Moon Cell. The entire story actually takes place within the supercomputer of the moon. Um, it was discovered... It, it, it had existed since the Earth did 4.6 billion years ago. It was created 100 million years beforehand by an advanced uh, alien species, in order to monitor Earth's progress, and it's it, there's a bunch of nonsense technical information in there, like it scans the Earth every nanosecond and uploads data into the supercomputer. Also, the supercomputer was discovered by a wizard who was working for the United Nations in the 1970s, right? Yeah, because yeah. fate is also very normal. <laughs> uh, it it all, it just it compiles records of the Earth, and the the whole series of Fate Extra takes place there. Uh, Here's another fun one that should be pretty obvious, is Giants uh, and the Nephilim. So Giants are another thing which are a little bit more understandable as to how Giants uh, exist in multiple different cultures. There are tons of references to Giants in almost every culture in the world, and it is, it's, just, it's just easy to come up with Giant people as a concept. Uh, but the Bible actually has a lot of information about giants and Nephilim. The uh, Nephilim are said to be that the sons of Seth and the daughters of Cain. The sons of Seth are angels that rebelled against God. The daughters of Cain are obviously daughters of man. They mated and created the Nephilim, who are half-angel, half-human hybrids, who are said to be gigantic creatures, much stronger, much more powerful than normal humans. And I'm not sure if Goliath was ever confirmed to be a Nephilim or not, but it was also estimated by the by the uh, by the scale given in the Bible that Goliath is only about seven foot nine inches tall. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. People were small back then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there is also the there is also like some evidence that pops up for giants uh, in the past every so often. Usually, it's just mammoth or elephant bones. But there is a giant of Castlenau who was uh, discovered, uh, in, and the bones were dated back to the Neolithic age. They only discovered the humerus, the tibia, and, and the femoral midshaft, but by those estimates of those, and they weren't necessarily debunked as mammoth bones, by those estimates they would say that the giant was 11 feet 6 inches tall. And... Uh, there has also been Robert Wadlow, who was the tallest confirmed human in existence at 8 foot 11 inches. He died in his 20s after he got an infection on an, uh, I guess, if, if, I think it was on his foot or something like that. But giant humanoids are, again, in every culture there are, uh, King Arthur was apparently a giant. Uh, in North America, there are Native American myths of giants that ate, that were cannibalistic. Uh, even in Japan, there are, um, there are myths about giants uh, within the numerous amount of Japanese mythology. And obviously, there are stories such as Jack and the Beanstalk, where giants are cannibalistic as well. And many people believe that giants did exist in the past, that governments are covering them up for whatever reason. It is more along the lines of something like cryptozoology, where people will claim to have seen giants or have evidence of giants, but proof is very hard to come by. And it should be obvious which show this is going to be about, but yes, Attack on Titan. Uh, the Ajime Isayama was like obsessed with giants and really wanted to, them to be on the same playing field as like zombies are in pop culture. So obviously he was pretty successful with his story. Uh, with the final season, I think either airing still or coming to a close pretty soon. The manga's already ended uh, for however people responded to that. Uh, there was also Orphan, which is an older property, that did make use of some Far East mythology for giants within its main story. But 
the first one that everybody would think of is Attack on Titan. The uh, the the small slight spoiler warning was that humans are piloting the giants as well, which I didn't know. I don't believe there was any direct information for within the uh, mythology within real life, but it is it would make sense that giants were tied to humans and to some degree. Uh, whether that be them piloting them directly or whether that be humans being descended from them. And uh, to speed up a little bit, to try and get this done, as much done as I can by three, there was John Titer, who was a time traveler, alleged time traveler in the 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s, who posted on uh, Coast to Coast. He sent in a few letters to Art Bell on Coast to Coast claiming to be a time traveler from the year 2036. He predicted that there would be a civil war in 2004-2005 time frame, that there would be a world war in uh, 2015. The The reason that John Titer has pervaded the public mind for so long is because no one's ever found out who he was. And he knew things about the IBM 5100 computer that only people in IBM would have known and that was under lock and key they never advertised it to the public and even today the functions have not been fully revealed but he he spoiled a few things about it that uh, no one outside of ibm should have known which was very interesting and yeah i see there's already a comment here this is a pretty obvious one this is steins gate uh steins gate used chiyomaru Sak shikira shikura sorry uses John Titer as well as another theory I'll talk about here in a minute. He's really into that conspiracy theory stuff. The main the character of John Titer is very important to the plot. I won't spoil it since it is a pretty big spoiler. But uh the IBM I not IBM, but it's the IBN I believe it is in Steins Gate is very important to the plot as well for time travel purposes. John Titer actually even talked about world lines in his letters to Art Bell in the 90s and 2000s, and World Lines are a big point part of Steins Gate as well. Uh, Chiamaru also liked to talk about the Committee of 300, which is an Illuminati-like organization that was founded by British arit aristocracy in the 1700s, uh, potentially also founded as a, uh, a arm of the East India Company, depending on which theory you want to go with. And that is just a committee of 300 very important people who need, who fit the needs of conspiracy theorists to fit a multitude of controls or whatever. And in Robotics Notes, there is a member of the committee of 300 that is the main antagonist whose goal is to reduce the human population. And that that is pretty much it for the robotics notes like the committee of 300 actually is in chiyomaru's other works as well they are present in steins gate they are present in occultic nine uh and he he kind of likes to do that tied together universe all of his shows take place within the same universe uh, although the timelines are wacky because of time travel so yeah it, those those are very fun series for anybody who wants to watch any of that we also have uh, here Amun-Ra, who is a cursed uh, Egyptian princess that allegedly was so cursed that anybody that came into contact with the mummy sank, or uh, not sank, but reached misfortune by either dying or reaching financial ruin. Apparently even Helena Blavatsky tried to perform an exorcism on it, said that there was no way it was going to happen and left. And then the rumor goes that a greedy American businessman wanted the mummy, so he had her shipped on the Titanic, and the Titanic sunk. And she is actually stored in the British Museum. She's never actually left the British Museum. There's been no evidence of her ever leaving the British Museum. But she was used in Zero Escape, Nine Hours, Nine Persons, Nine Doors, uh, named All Ice, also known as Alice, one of the characters in the game. And instead of being preserved in the normal way for mummies at the time, somehow they were able to provide to cryogenically freeze her in ice nine, which is ice that has a higher melting point than normal ice. And her story kind of follows the the myth of real life up until the 
timeline of the game when she's needed to be used in the actual story itself. And uh, she was placed in the Gigantic, which was actually apparently the original name of the HMS, HMS Britannic, built after the Titanic sank. And so they, they, the uh, Uchi Koishi used a lot of that influence in building out her profile, which I found pretty interesting. And to get into the end here, I'm actually over time, but uh, we have Aleister Crowley, who has a gigantic biography. Way too much to get into. Almost too much for me to even go over what I've copied here. He was used in a certain magical index. They didn't change anything about his backstory from real life. They just said he's an anime character. He's going in the story. They made him. A, they made him an androgynous pretty boy. Okay. Uh, with you know his magical powers real in there. Mm. But uh, for anybody who wants to learn about Alistair Crowley, listen to the last podcast on the left's episode about him. Very interesting stuff. Mm. Helena Blavatsky, one of the most important occultic members of the 20th century and the 19th century controversial figure no one sure if she actually contributed or disparaged the occultism but she did uh influence quite a lot of it she is used in uh fate grand order as a cute anime girl uh of course and she has reference she, she the the fate character is a ufo fan girl because blavatsky believed in uh, alien root races her subspecies singularity number two, for those who know what that means within the context of the game, is called Agartha as well. So, to wrap up here, we have also Nessie, who has appeared in several different properties, including Dinosaur King, Yachaman Knight, Dragon Ball Super, and Dr. Slump. Uh, we have Chuetsu Sekai, which is the anime done by Om Shinrikyo, oh, wow. who was responsible for the sarin gas attacks in Tokyo. Who, which also feature in Mamoru Penguin Drum, but not to a degree that I could really feature them here because it was just used as a premise. And we also have The Laws of the Universe, which is a higher production anime but done by the Happy Science Club, which is a new age, probably cult group that uh, is led by Ryuko Okawa. And the show was actually licensed by Eleven Arts for anybody who wants to pick it up. Uh, but anyway, that's the end of the panel. I'm glad that uh, I was able to get the time. I wasn't sure if I had enough content, but for anybody that wants to check out more of my stuff, hopefully this gets accepted to Otakon. We'll be at, uh, a lot of us will be at Otakon presenting. Uh, hopefully a lot of our stuff gets accepted. And yeah, if uh, anybody wants to reach out to me, my email is jcoale2 at gmail.com. Or, like I said, Brent has contact information with me on Discord. Yep. But that's it. Cool. Okay. I want to thank Justin for being involved in all of this. Like, it's, I really appreciate it. Um, that's been great. Um, any other questions? Um, we don't have to, like, stop right here. I want to make sure anyone gets a, a chance to uh, uh, do stuff. Yeah, I'll answer whatever questions I yeah. know the answers to. Um, FMA. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I always... You know, for that first half hour, I was like, I know where this one's going. Um, here we go. Um, um, another one, if you're interested for um, um, cult-funded conspiracy, cult-funded anime, um, Eyes of Mars. Oh, that was cult-funded. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, and does technically have a cons a um, humans come from another planet sort of origin story thing? Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, actually, no. Technically, do y'all mind if I spoil it for you? So it's set on Mars. Um, there's a New Age sort of group on Mars, and but and Mars is basically falling apart. Everything's collapsing. Um, techno future. You know, everything's everything's screwed. And um, um, then there's a nuclear war. Yay. Um, and the souls of all of the people who die go off of Mars and then go down to, to Earth where you discover that it's the, like, um, Paleolithic era. And so they all go into kind of all of the 
proto-humans. And so that's how we all got raised to be human and to be able to, you know, what use tools. What's called called under that? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It sounds, it sounds like Scientology. Like Scientology. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think it was just one of... I don't you think Scientology was Mars, though. Yeah. No. Um, but it, it was some, like, New Age organization, I believe. Um, but, yeah. So, I don't see any other questions. So thank you all for watching that. Next up on the list, let me see if I can find, I think I may have closed everything down. I did indeed. Uh, one second. Need to reopen all of the windows. Um, so next up um, at 3.30, we're going to be have another panel from Steve uh, about filler anime you may, have, you may be missing. And uh, we will go to that in a little bit. But first, I um, want to give you a quick preview. Some of the stuff we'll be auctioning off at 6.30 p.m. at the charity auction. Um, if you're interested in some Jujutsu Kaisen, we have some of that manga here. If you're interested in um, Girls' Last Tour, we have some of that manga here. Uh, if you're interested in Space Battleship Yamato, actually Space Cruiser Yamato on the, the box, because this is a model kit from 1980, um, that isn't as an option. Um, I'm trying to think of anything that like, ties into what you're talking about. Strawberry Panic, not a lot of conspiracy theories in that one. Um, let's see here. Uh, we've got some silent voice stuff. Um, Tomoyori Hitotose. And we've also got all the stuff from the, um, uh, dorm an an animator, dormitory, an animator Dormitory Project. So we've got some giveaways from that. So those will be auctioned off in a little bit. Uh, meanwhile, we will go ahead and go on a quick break, and we will be back in um, about 23-ish minutes. <laughs>